everyone, and welcome back to SuperCloud 5, the battle for AI supremacy. I'm Lisa Martin along with Savannah Peterson. We're live in Palo Alto and our esteemed colleagues are in Las Vegas, creating and producing some fab live content on AI, the battle for supremacy. Guess who's back? Yes, he's back, back again. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. 12-timer <laughs> Vaughn Stewart, VP of Systems Engineering at Vast Data. Vaughn, great to see you again. It's only been a matter of weeks. Yeah, it's just been days, it feels like. It uh, does. Hopefully everybody had great Thanksgiving and uh, Got AWS reInvent going on, and I appreciate you having uh, having me here for SuperCloud 5. So SuperCloud 5, this is our, our fifth edition. Savannah and I, this is our first one, so we're very excited to be here. We think it's the sexiest one, by the way. But I did a little asking of the Cube AI, define SuperCloud for us. And it talked about what the Cube is doing, gathering this community of experts, hyperscale computing experts, technologists like Vaughn, investors, thought leaders, exploring Gen AI, its impact on the major cloud titans. Talk a little bit about some of the things that when you hear the term super cloud, the concept, what does it mean to you? That's a great question. I, I think the way that we at Vast Data uh, look at super cloud is really in the, the, the retooling of enterprise infrastructures to make them AI ready, mm -hmm. um, to allow the democratization of their, their IP and assets to, and to be consumed by uh, AI tools, large language models, multi, multimodal large language models, uh, accelerated computing applications, uh, as well as this birth of this new class of hyperscale cloud providers, right? The AI or the GPU hyperscale providers like the CoreWeave or Lambda or Core42, right? They're, they're dramatically different than AWS and Azure and Google. I mean, yeah, sure, all of them have some form of GPU or, or TPU or IPU, whatever whatever accelerated platform they have, but their ability to actually service the, the needs of large scale customers who are deep in this Gen AI space, right? It's just, it's like orders of magnitude difference between uh, these hyperscale GPU cloud providers. And, and I don't want to say legacy, but Traditional? Traditional, maybe that's a better term. Venerable. Venerable, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I, I want to talk, you, you just said a phrase that we haven't heard on the show, but I think, I, I want you to break it down a little bit. We hear a lot about the democratization of AI. We've got a lot of collaborators in, in the space, but you said, you talked about democratizing IP to give people access. So now when we think about the big old players in the Silicon Valley, we're home here in Palo Alto, you wanted to keep your secrets. In fact, there have been oodles and oodles of lawsuits and a lot of expenditure around secret keeping. And so when you say democratize IP for these enterprises, what does that journey actually look like for them? Great question. So the best way that I, that I think I could, could communicate what we're doing and how we're democratizing the data for AI is vast data provi or vast data provides a data platform for enterprises and cloud service providers. And our platform is really unifying data storage with databases and compute engine services um, that's all packaged together in a scalable platform that allows customers to, to, to have their data accessible globally, um, on-prem or in the cloud. And the reason why we've got all these capabilities within our platform is because of the way that data is being used today, right? You've got to be able to support the, the security, availability, you know, um, the governance aspects of enterprise data, right? Where your assets mm -hmm. live today with the performance scalability that you need for, to power GPUs, right? So that you can do your research um, and you have to make it, make it accessible because you know like data management is as as um, important as like model management and model security and so some of the things that we're seeing customers do with our data platform is is deploy on-prem right have have some j i um, gen ai models llm work going on internally but also extend that into the cloud they don't have to move their data right but they can, they can extend their vast instance into uh, AWS, and now they can have access to more models and more tools for their data set. And with the cost of GPUs today, right, and the strategic investments that are being made, yeah. there's a lot of pressure on validating, 
right, your, your, your thesis of, of expanding your portfolio or getting to ROI, if you will. And so the ability to, to tap into the current IP, to accelerate it with the new tools, to make it available through different models, we're the only ones that are, that are powering that capability today. And we're seeing it just across the board, all types of industries, use cases, um, whether we're talking about like natural language processing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, VFX in, in rendering forms, life science, like, you know, like, like brain research and, and analysis, and just so on and on and on, right? So, you know, off camera, you asked me like, like what's the most interesting thing happening in AI? And my comment was, it's this whole like leapfrog or evolution within what we can do inside of our data centers on-prem or in the cloud. And, the, and the, the outcome is like profound. It's exponential acceleration of computing power. Speaking of that well acceleration, stated. I'd love to understand what you're seeing from a budget perspective for AI adoption versus traditional IT budgets. Where are customers in trying to understand kind of the, the financials and how to make the best decisions with the resources that they have today? Yeah, we're, we're seeing from um, every industry significant investment in AI. It's, it's, it's the number one budget line item inside of IT departments right now. In fact, even taking budget away from more kind of run of the mill or keep the business running initiatives. I think beyond, you know, beyond AI, you know, maybe cyber protection is probably like the second highest right now. And then maybe third is like cloud costs. Uh, and again, that, that investment is driving a lot of, a lot of pressure on um, getting your initiatives up and running. And so what we're seeing is kind of bifurcated a little bit. We're seeing the, the on-prem infrastructure folks, right, really struggling on making a decision about what type of infrastructure purchase do I make? Yeah, they, they know Cerebras and they know NVIDIA and they know, uh, you know AMD. They know they're going to get some form of accelerated computing platform. But, you know, what do they do for fabric? What do they do for storage, right? And so there's a lot of focus from that perspective. And conversely, in, in the same equation, we're seeing customers say, I just need to move faster. And so I'm going to go reach out to a, to a, you know, a Core Weave or a Lambda or a Core 42 because I, because I can move faster. I mean, uh, just to give you one example, we kind of talked about um, the traditional hyperscalers. Mm -hmm. They all have GPUs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they've got a lot of customers using them, right? This is not meant to be uh, a, a negative comment on them, but there was a gap in the market about the performance and scale at which they deliver these services. So if you look at, at something like, like Inflection AI, right? Mm -hmm. they, they leverage 22,000 you know, NVIDIA H100 GPUs fr from CoreWeave, right? And CoreWeave's business is growing like mad. They just built a, a data center in Texas. It's, it's valued at $1.6 billion. Ooh. And they're building 13 more. Wow. Um, you flip over and you look at something like like Core 42 and, and Core 42 who's partnering with Cerebris, they're working on supercomputers and that are going to release next year that provide 36 exaflops of AI computing power. Like, That's not even possible right. for me to comprehend. Right. Like, like what do we do with that? It's like an infinite universe of stars right. and galaxies <laughs> of potential yeah. Yeah. power, essentially. It, it, and bring it into, the, into, the, you know, into the, the West Coast here. Look at Lambda Labs, right? Yeah. The, the Lambda Cloud, right? They're making everything super simple for their customers. They've got their whole, you know, one click, you download, or you type the line, I should say, you, you, but you download, you know, their, their toolkit, and whether you're on-prem, in the cloud, on your laptop, you're enabled. It's a one-click refresh of the tool sets, and they will rent you today a, a, an NVIDIA H100 GPU for just over a dollar an hour. That's anywhere from 50 to 75% off the price wow. of the traditional hyperscalers. So, all three of these, again, these these AI or GPU hyperscalers, they're just their business is going gangbusters. So then, what's your forecast for the traditional hyperscalers? What are some of the things that they need to do to be able to be as competitive with the GPU hyperscalers to enable customers to go as fast as they're expecting they can? Yeah, that's that's a, a, a good question, and I've got to watch you know what I share here. But we're for uh, all the secrets. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, all the hyperscalers are, are investing in, in chips, right? I just recently read about, you know, the Azure, Microsoft Azure, as you know, uh, I think it's pronounced Maya chip. Um, I want to make sure I don't mispronounce it, but, you know, so they're all getting into expanding the, the number of accelerated compute, compute platforms that they have. And obviously they've got all the three major uh, hyperscalers have relationships with NVIDIA. Um, 
But when you look at the rest of their infrastructure, right, the, the speed of the fabric, the, the storage platform to be able to um, feed the GPUs, right? GPU utilization right now is probably the biggest challenge that they have. Um, and so I think they're going to have to look at some infrastructure investments um, and maybe even partnering opportunities to try to help solve that if they want to get to the level where the current GPU hyperscalers are. Well, and I think there's going to be a middle market there that we're not talking about. We're talking about you know very large enterprise applications. There are people who need to run smaller batches that require less compute to do that. And I think what you're talking about there, that optimization, yeah. is actually going to be one of the maybe less sexier conversations, but more lucrative and important margins to optimize as people build out their stacks. Oh, I agree, absolutely. And, and I want to be clear here, there's, there's a lot of AI work going on in all the traditional hyperscalers. But when we talk to customers, and, and we've talked to a lot who've gone from a journey from a traditional to one of the, the more modern GPU hyperscalers, they talk about challenges of, of scale of some of their use cases. So, um, uh, kind of talked about it before, like, like multimodal large language models, uh, uh, rendering forms. Um, these are areas where uh, pixel streaming, for example, that just they're not able to scale on the traditional infrastructure, not because of the GPU, because what's behind the GPU inside of the, the, the traditional, I should infrastructure, but the traditional clouds, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm what's sure- What's happening I'm, inside the server. Yeah, I'm sure I'm not saying anything that, that you know the hyperscalers aren't well aware of, but you know, maybe, maybe customers who are looking for, or enterprises who are looking to figure out how do I accelerate my adoption of AI today? You know, what cloud choices should they be looking at? What's that journey like for customers that you've talked to that are going from traditional to GPU powered hyperscalers? What is that journey like for them from an infrastructure perspective, but also from a culture and a leadership perspective? Yeah, it's, I wish there was a, a, a simple sentiment. I can share with you a couple larger themes um, First is uh, organizations that are in regulated industries. The, th not all, right, I don't want to make an absolute statement, but a large portion of, of those types of co uh, companies or enterprises are, are still kind of investing on-prem, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. IP leakage, you know, data protection uh, of, you know, of their intellectual property. Uh, they're forcing significant investments on-prem. Uh, but with that said, they have teams that are out testing the different models and tools on various clouds um, so that they can build up their skill sets, right? Start to, to, to accelerate the pace at which they're going to actually be able to utilize this new form of science inside of their infrastructure. Uh, we're also seeing with those that are, that are whether they're on-prem or in the cloud, this, this challenge between um, how long can I keep my legacy on-prem infrastructure in place? It's tried and true, it's trusted, it's big name brands with banners and in, in logos in blue or orange, uh, <coughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but they can't feed their GPUs. Yeah. And so there's this realization that the on-prem infrastructure, just like we talked about it with the, the traditional hyperscalers, the on-prem infrastructure needs to be modernized and you know, either do f brittle and fragile HPC for performance or you do slow and reliable and easy to manage enterprise storage, or you look for an alternative. And that's really the kind of the, the gap that we've filled within the market today. Um, and you know, our growth is being driven by the AI growth. Um, from the cloud provider side, um, I think we touched base on it from, a, from a, uh, the customers or the consumers of that cloud, right? It's a race to evolve their products and their product offerings um, to be able to, to do so without having to make a capital investment, right. right? So I think, you know, speed, time to market. Whether these customers stay on these, these cloud platforms indefinitely, I think we'll probably, you know, years from now, right, kind of see just like what we've seen with the traditional hyperscalers, where, you know, you launch your product, you get to a certain scale, now you got to start looking at cost economics. And there's a lot of stories about, about organizations born in the cloud who eventually, right. you know, repatriated to some other type of yes. platform. Maybe we'll see that over time, who knows? We're talking a lot about traditional versus some modern applications in the GPU space and a lot of spaces. Something that we haven't defined very well, but I think it's actually quite relevant to this conversation is the difference between traditional and generative AI. Can you break that down for the audience? Um, generative AI um, really kind of burst onto the scene about a year ago, right? With chat GPT-3, right? It really moved everyone's mind share. Yeah. I think you could look at 
<clears throat> you could look at traditional machine learning, right? It still was kind of like this black art science, right? This, if you will, uh, adjacent relative to HPC. Um, but Gen AI, I think, really got everyone's imaginations moving forward, right? What can I, what can I build with this generative AI? So, for example, if you look at like uh, multimodal large language models, right, or MLLMs, right, they have the ability to take in um, a diverse set of inputs, right? Uh, audio, visual, whether still or, or video, um, text inputs, right? And they're able to take that diverse set of input and actually, you know, learn from it, understand, and then actually, you know, apply, you know, learnings from that. And you look at that type of technology, um, a great use case right now is like, like self-driving cars, right? It's always was this, was this, deep technical stack kind of built from the bottom up, but was always with, with strict rules, if you will, and logic. Oh yeah. And would really struggle with like the emergency vehicle or road repairs, right? Where right. lanes got, where, mm -hmm. yeah, where you got to switch over, cross squirrel over lanes, dog versus... squirrel dog, cross over lanes, yeah. man's holding a sign. Okay. Yeah. And now when you look at like MLLMs in the autonomous driving space and the opportunity that they pre present to now be able to react to tens of thousands, if not millions of unique scenarios that maybe can solve some of the issues that we've seen here, even in San Francisco in recent months, right? right. With some of the self-driving vehicles having yes. some challenges. Oopsies. A lot of drama, almost as right. much drama as open AI on the autonomous vehicle space <laughs> here in the city the last few weeks in the Silicon Valley. It's been a Definitely. spicy one. It, ha it has been spicy. Very spicy. You <laughs> talked about some really cool use cases, VFX rendering, autonomous driving, life sciences. As we round out 2023 and we're heading into 2024, which is hard to believe that Y2K was that long ago and we can all remember it. But as we do, what, Thanks for that what, lovely, useful welcome. reminder this morning, Lisa. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just had an age spot yeah, here on my yes. hand. I'm Thanks. so sorry. <laughs> but as we do that, as, as my young friends have read historical analysis of, of Y2K, what do you think being AI ready in 2024 is, is actually going to mean to organizations and how is VAST going to help them achieve that status? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I, I think of it in, 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 in two ways. One that we touched on a little bit already, which is um, customers making AI investments quickly learn that they can't keep their GPUs um, effic running efficiently. Just like we were talking about. If they about. have to keep shuffling data from their legacy silo yep. to the AI silo and then evict it and move it back and forth. And in fact, we've met with some large enterprises there's kind of like a consistent theme, like what's your GPU utilization? 20%, but we're not moving things fast enough, so we're gonna buy more GPUs. And you're that's like, common, yeah. It's, it's your fabric in your storage platform that's your bottleneck, right. not your GPUs, right? And, and in relative dollars, the fabric and the storage is a fraction of what enterprises spend on the GPUs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a little bit of a maturation of understanding that um, AI is no longer an HPC science experiment off in the, in the, in the, the back room it now has to become pervasive through the enterprise and so retooling the architecture is part of it. The second aspect of it is, if you look at how um, important it is to AI, particularly around the accuracy of your, your models, right, the output of the models, right, the accuracy of your inference, for example, um, it's really a byproduct of how, you know, how much data you can process, yeah. real data, not synthetic data, data that's been enriched with lots of like metadata tags and is always, mm -hmm. you know, always being um, expanded upon in terms of the, 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 the model base. Um, so if you look at what we're doing in terms of collapsing the different tools in the infrastructure so that we can, you know, support, you know, uh, querying of, your, of all your data and the tags so you know which data that you need to be looking at, yeah. the ability for us to be able to take streams, process the data and get it uh, better prepared for AI, right? We're taking time out of that model, and that's just native within our platform, where today, if you're going to do it, you're dealing with lots of different bespoke systems, yeah. lots of multiple points of failure, right? Different teams with subject matter expertise. We're trying to collapse it all, simplify, and at the end result, accelerate what customers can do with their data. And that's what they want. They want to be able to accelerate what they can do with data, make business impact, drive new revenue streams, new products, new services, delight customers, because it's the one thing that keeps going up as consumers is our expectations that everything is going to be real time, it's going to be personalized, and you're going to deliver me exactly what I want. Oh, 
And they want to do it wherever they are, too. Absolutely. And I think that location matters. I'm curious. You're in a really sweet spot in the market. I can tell where you're having a bit of a moment and have that wonderful grin on your face. How does this, uh, what are the conversations around AI at the edge? Because this just makes that problem even harder. Um, you know, I would love to pontificate on the challenges for AI at the edge. Uh, uh, we, don't make a, we don't make a product that fits every use case today. Today, right, you know, our, our scale uh, really limits us to service providers mm -hmm. and enterprise. Uh, you know, our starting footprint uh, is 100 terabytes, and so you don't see a lot of 100 terabyte at Ooh. the edge. And so, um, while I would, if you do, I would like to see what yeah. that edge device is doing, <laughs> quite frankly. And so, I'd love to speak speak to the edge, but to be honest with you, right now, so much of our focus is helping the infrastructure for these cloud providers and these enterprises that I haven't had time to to take a step back and look at the edge. Do you find that your customers are more excited about the future or feeling FOMO that they might get to the future and be in the wrong position? Oh, I think there's excitement, FOMO, and FOFU. So what What's I FOFU? Of effing up? Yes. Oh! Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. I'm <laughs> great with my F acronyms, y'all. You really John, are. Doesn't, John doesn't let me say them very often here on the queue, but thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, so the, the, there's excitement, right? And it's coming from the, the, the CTO, the office of the CTO and the, the CIO's yeah. office about how do we evolve Right, our product line, right? These are the, the, the kind of, if you will, the glass half full visionary track folks, right? There's everything we, we might be able to do with Gen AI. There's the FOMO, which are the folks who are like, I'm not sure what I can do with it, but I'm worried about being leapfrogged, so let's, let's get an order process right now and figure this out. Uh, and then there's the poor infrastructure folks. And those are the folks with the FOFU. They're like, I'm being tasked, yeah. I don't know what to do. I've got a lot of, of brands and vendors that I trust historically and now I'm getting pushed into a new wave of infrastructure support, and I don't want to be the one that the finger gets pointed to if for some reason this, this falls down. You don't want to be, be the FOFU culprit? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad I learned a new acronym today. Thank you both. <laughs> Here to help you with your My acronyms life is anytime you want, darling. <laughs> Here to help you. Always great to have you back. We need to get like a 12 timers jacket, but next time is. Oh, uh, he needs a pen present. or a bag. Yeah, do I get a gold jacket at like 12 times? I feel times like a or, jacket or with yeah. like a gold lapel is in order. Ooh. I'm going to put it We're taking there. orders. We're yep. taking orders. Yep. We'll take measurements later. Yeah, it'll be Deal. great. <laughs> 40 regular. All right. <laughs> cool. All right. I think that might be the. Okay, sweetheart, sorry. We, we're both so excited to talk to you. They didn't tell us who was closing this interview, so I was just oh. giving them a little bit of limbo. I want to give you one last closing note since we just had that moment. We talked about aliens in our last segment, <laughs> and I am, I am going to make it a theme of the day because why not? If we're talking about a future that is yet to be realized in a lot of aspects, I don't see why we wouldn't be talking about the futures of other things going on in uh, the universe or other universes or who knows. Do you believe in aliens, Vaughn? Absolutely, uh, but not in the bipedal sci-fi fashion. Um, the universe is so vast, and there are so many planets that have the potential to support life. I absolutely believe in life throughout the universe. Now, do I believe in little green men in spaceships? The bipedals. Co yeah, coming to Earth and landing, <laughs> and you know, um, <clears throat> maybe you know, collecting some of us for probes. No, I, I don't believe in that. <laughs> All right, Vaughn, well, on that note, we look forward to appearance number 13 here on the Cube. Lisa, I look forward to the next four days getting to co-host next to you. Same. And I look forward to sharing this entire experience with all of you live here from the Cube studio in Palo Alto, as well as our fantastic editorial coverage from Las Vegas. That's actually where we'll be going next. We have John Furrier and Dave Vellante with their keynote analysis editorial take from AWS reInvent down there in Sin City. In the meantime, my name's Savannah Peterson, and you're watching The Cube, the leading source for cloud and generative AI coverage.